Greetings, Dr. Mark Winton here from the University of Central Florida Department of Criminal Justice. And what I'd like to do today is introduce you to the course, Famous Crimes and Trials. Uh, if you look at the syllabus, you can see the course objectives. First, the course description is basically uh, to provide a detailed examination of selected famous American crimes and trials since 1900. So that will be the main focus of our course. Of, and you can look at the objectives. We'll be looking at a variety of uh, famous crimes and trials and looking at the legal issues, collection of um, evidence, uh, trial strategies, how problems were addressed, an analysis of the historical uh, aspects, the legal and political issues, and the impact of the media, and if changes were made in the criminal justice system based on the outcomes and nature of the trial. The textbook that we will be using, uh, really an excellent book, uh, Geis and Vienen's uh, 1998 Crimes of the Century from Leopold and Loeb to O.J. Simpson. Basically, we're using this older text because it does an excellent job of presenting cases up to the 90s um, and uh, really outlines cases how I would uh, have wanted to teach a course like this. Of course, we will be supplementing uh, the... Um, materials with more current information that will be posted online in the Canvas web environment. So, so that will have additional uh, materials as well. If we look at the introduction uh, chapter, basically, the big question the authors make or ask is, what makes a crime a crime of the century? Some of the things that they recommend that we examine is the social climate of the time period, the politics involved, and the actual nature of the criminal justice system. And they look at particular patterns, for example, the location, the outrageousness of the crime, uh, the identities of the offender and victims, the details of the particular crime, uh, how politics and power are related to that particular case, and also the mystery and, and ambiguity in the nature of the crime and the case. Some of the things I would also add would be how the media presents it, if the media presents it, also recent events and previous cases, the novelty um, of the case, uh, public opinion about the case, uh, technology, and social control. And there's a lot of different aspects that can go into a legal analysis of, of the case, some of the factors that uh, I just mentioned, but certainly we can take a close look at um, the whole history of similar cases or, or recent cases of, of a similar nature. Uh, also, we can do assessments of the demographics of uh, the defendant. We'll begin to look closely at certain um, features of a case that relate to who that particular defendant happens to be, as well as who the victim or victims are. Uh, we'll also have to consider the risk of wrongful conviction, the nature of evidence at the particular time, and the biases and arguments within the criminal justice system the use and misuse of science, and uh, some other factors as well will always come into play. We can also think about different theories and, and strategies of analyzing any particular legal case. And um, there are a variety of themes that we will cover throughout uh, the semester. For example, we will look at uh, the, the changing nature of um, scientific evidence. We'll also look at the um, political and social climate of the time and how uh, particular groups of people were viewed by the general public and by the criminal justice system. We'll also look at particular laws uh, of the time and how that relates to um, the, the trial. In conducting a legal analysis, though, we also want to look at the drama of the trial. We want to look at the conflicts 
that become apparent in society. That trials represent not just a um, particular legal case, but also represent many times the values of society, the needs of society, the anxieties of society. And we may also ask, how does society create crimes in that regard and, and construct these particular trials regarding specific crimes? We also could think about all those famous crimes that remain unsolved. And there certainly are uh, many of, of those that we could look at. We might also think about going a little bit uh, farther in, into the theoretical realm, we might ask the question, why do people obey the law or fail to obey the law in, in the first place? And looking at the whole idea of when laws appear to be successful, uh, there's a variety of, of, of factors. For example, that the laws um, come from a prestigious source. They're rational and understandable. Uh, they work. They are enforceable. There's support from law enforcement, there are particular sanctions, and there's equal enforcement. And so we confirm, we, we, we obtain conformity in a variety of ways, and we'll see this is also related. And as Friedrichs points out in his book, Law in Our Lives, an Introduction, the third edition published in 2012, uh, Oxford University Press, what drives legal reform? And Friedrichs points out the growth of society, the new economic system, new technology, new social conditions, uh, particular groups that have power to uh, focus on a specific crime or situation that's defined as a crime, special interest groups, basically, um, and public interests as well. Let me give you an example of the technology changes. It really uh, is only recently that we see situations where a YouTube video may go viral with a particular crime uh, taped, posted for millions to see, and then uh, that particular uh, video becoming evidence in a case. And we're seeing a lot more due to our um, advances and expansion of surveillance that a lot more uh, visual evidence of crimes is certainly uh, becoming apparent. And I think that's going to be very relevant to look at as well. We keep seeing clips of videos of particular uh, situations that some define as crime, some define as not crime. And that certainly plays a, a new role in the new surveillance and technology and cases. Friedrichs also points out that the basic functions of law are to um, create order in a society and to resolve conflict. Additionally, and we'll see this in many of the cases, one function of the law is the release of emotions of the community and society. Also for uh, justice, for the community and society to feel that justice has been served and to promote values and the smooth functioning of society. But there are also some dysfunctions of the law, as Friedrichs points out. For example, maintaining the status quo, and we know it's very difficult to change the legal system and the criminal justice system. In other words, the criminal justice system tends to be resistant to change, and change is relatively slow. The law may also divide society, exploit certain groups, create conflict and oppression, and give uh, state power or particular groups extra power in society that could be misused. And I think when we think about these cases and we think about the time period, uh, it, it, it's often interesting to think about, well, is society anomic or alienated at that particular time as opposed to other particular times? In other words, why that trial becomes, why does that trial become very important at that particular time and would it have become important in another period of time? And, and really, what I want to point out, this whole con these two concepts, anomy and alienation, let me define them first. Durkheim basically uh, believed, uh, Emile Durkheim, the French sociologist, believed that problems occurred when there was not enough social control, and this led to anomy, or basically feelings of normlessness, not knowing what the rules are, confusion. And this was a problem when there's not enough social control. Uh, Karl Marx, the um, uh, sociologist and political philosopher, believed that problems occurred when there was 
too much social control, and he referred to that as alienation. When there's too much social control, people begin to feel alienated from themselves and others, and this leads to uh, mistrust and other problems in uh, society. A big question to ask uh, when those trials are going on that we study, is, is society at that particular time anomic or alienated? Or is there going to be a lot of debate? Or are there certain uh, you know, aspects of anomy and alienation? It's really an interesting question to look at because I often hear people arguing there's not enough social control regarding certain uh, situations in, in the legal system. Others argue there's too much social control. And, of course, we have to figure out how do we analyze that in an appropriate manner. I'm not going to go into details about Donald Black's work, although I wanted to mention it because it's very fascinating. Basically, uh, in The Behavior of Law, published way back in 1976, but a classic, uh, Black states that law is governmental social control and that law is also a quantitative variable. We can quantify law in, in, in that sense. And what I wanted to do is just mention a couple of questions derived from um, reading uh, Professor Black's work. For example, how does one's social status relate to experience in the criminal justice system? How do relationships impact the legal case? In other words, relationships that people have with others in that community and society. And what about cultural aspects in the legal system in terms of looking at similarities and differences uh, by um, culture? So there's lots of questions that can be generated from um, Donald Black's work when he starts looking at uh, a variety of um, features. For example, he proposes that law varies inversely with other social control. In other words, the quantity of law varies in particular locations and in specific time periods. He also uh, stated that law varies directly with um, respectability. And um, we can look at how that comes into play in these cases as well, because the defendants and the victims are always on trial in that sense in the trial of public opinion or the court of public opinion as often uh, the, is, is, is pointed out. And so we'll look at that further as well. We'll also look at, for example, Ewick and Sylvie talk about the narrative, looking at uh, basically uh, storytelling and how storytelling is organized and regulated and this occurs also in the courtroom narrative. We have good and bad stories and stories may conceal and um, these stories are extremely relevant that we'll see. I remember a uh, friend of mine who is an attorney was talking it was told me he was talking to a judge who was frustrated after a particular case involving a uh, family dispute and um, the judge basically said to the two um, family members involved in the legal dispute uh, that I've heard from you and I've heard from you and based on what both of you told me one of you is lying and I better not find out which one it is I thought that was an interesting view and um, it represents in some cases what the basic bare bones of a trial. Also, I wanted to bring in Irving Goffman's dramaturgical approach, just a wonderful way to analyze not only trials and courtroom behavior, but social life. And um, Goffman talked about in his work, for example, that we can analyze everyday social life as ongoing dramas or plays, and we can take this approach and look at crimes and trials, where we look at some of the features of the roles that uh, people play during that particular trial, their performances, um, how they act, basically. Um, you, you know, we can look at the, the courtroom as a stage and also the stages outside of the courtroom with talk show hosts and interviews with others. We can look at the different scenes in the courtroom and outside of the courtroom. We can look at the scripts that are played out, the audiences, the jury, the identities, and the symbols that are often used in the courtroom. In other words, the presentation of self. And so, welcome to the course. This 
wraps up this brief introduction and I'll certainly be providing a lot more additional information uh, through video and through PowerPoints and uh, other links to uh, websites and readings and I hope uh, that this is an excellent learning experience for you and I welcome you to the course. Thank you.